So welcome everybody to Ecological Movements in Kurdistan from Rojava to Bakur. My name is Blair Taylor and I'm the program director for the Institute for Social Ecology, which is sponsoring this event as part of an ongoing series organized by a Rojava working group. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Institute for Social Ecology, we're a popular education and movement reflection center founded in 1974 by the environmental philosopher Murray Bookchin and anthropologist Dan Chodorkoff. So for 46 years, our work has explored the intersection of social and ecological problems, guided by the core insight that the ecological crisis is rooted in social relationships of hierarchy, domination, and exploitation. And that in order to address the root causes of these problems, we need to build a directly democratic, cooperative, and a truly free society. So we offer educational programs, uh, online courses, summer schools, and events like this, all of which are aimed at clarifying and achieving these goals. So I'd like to invite you all to check out our various programs, which includes two online courses starting next week, one called Ecology, Democracy, Utopia. It's kind of an overview of social ecology and another on Frankfurt School Critical Theory. So it's for these same reasons that we've also been longtime supporters of the Kurdish freedom movement in Rojava and beyond. Uh, the democratic, feminist and pluralist movement there is perhaps the clearest living example of social ecology's political and ethical vision. Of course, as a uh, Many of you know this isn't surprising since uh, Kurdish leader Abdullah Ocalan read Bookchin's work in prison and these ideas influenced his democratic and federalist politics. So while most of the world by now is aware of the iconic female Kurdish fighters who defeated ISIS in northern Syria, the ecological component of this movement remains far less known. So today's event is going to spotlight how the struggle for democracy, women's emancipation, and ecology are all central and interconnected. So in a moment, my colleague Katie from London is going to introduce our two guest speakers, both of whom are longtime activists and experts on environmental movements in the area. So our esteemed guests are going to speak for about 20 to 30 minutes each. They're going to show some slides some pictures, and then we're going to have plenty of time for Q&A uh, and discussion facilitated by Katie. So thank you all for joining us today. I'm looking forward to a really uh, interesting and productive generative event. So I'm going to hand things over to Katie. Thanks, Blair. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Katie. Um, I'm an internationalist with the Kurdish Freedom Movement, and I organise here in the UK with Kurdistan Solidarity Network. Um, so I'm going to co-host this evening um, and facilitate the kind of Q&A after both of our speakers, um, but just a short introduction um, to both of those first of all. So uh, Vianne is an internationalist based in the UK as well, working with, with the Kurdish freedom movement. She spent one year in, in Rojava involved in ecological works, the women's movement and press work. Her background is in ecological food, ecological food sovereignty, feminist and anti-capitalist movements in the UK, where she continues to organise with the Kurdish freedom movement. Ershan Eboga grew up as a child of Kurdish migrants in Germany where he became politically active in early years. He was living also several times in North Kurdistan, the last time in 2015 and 2016, when he worked for the Diyarbakir, that's Ahmed, Metropolitan Municipality. Erchan co-founded the initiative to keep Hassan Kef alive in 2006, a long-time campaign against the destructive Megadam Ilusu on the T Tigris River. Evshan is also engaged in the Mesopotamian ecology movement, founded in 2012, and a broad social movement in North Turkish Kurdistan. The uh, Mesopotamian ecology movement includes the most uh, e ecology activists and, and considers itself um, as a part of the, the Kurdish freedom movement. So I'm sure uh, he can explain that a lot better than me. Um, and I will hand over to Ershan, who's going to um, give us a presentation about the work that he does with the Kurdish freedom movement. So over to you, Ershan. Hello to all of you. It's a big pleasure for me to be here, to be able to speak to you, thanks to the Institute for Social Ecology, Thanks to all of you to take the time and to spend these one, two hours with us. Uh, it's an expression of interest, what's going on in and around Kurdistan. Yes, uh, I will start 
using a, a slideshow presentation, digital presentation uh, with a history, not much, very short. Then I will come step by step uh, to the current time and what's going on, especially in North Kurdistan. I will from time to time uh, try to explain our political principle, basics or discussions we have. So, uh, and you will see many pictures and not much text. So it will be not a boring, I hope. So here is it. I hope you can see it. And yes, um, here you see a picture um, from Rojava. Uh, on the left side, it says water is life. Let's save the life. Av Gianne, Gianne de Parese. So it's a wonderful image I took in Rojava three, four years ago, uh, which summarized many things, what we think or what we want to uh, approach. On the right side, this is the logo of the Mesopotamia Ecology Movement. Here it's written in Turkish, Mesopotamia Ecology Harikiti. Yes, um, I think you know where uh, where the Kurds live, uh, what we understand under Kurdistan, the territory where the Kurds live in majority, divided in four states. I am from the north part, that's a big Turkish part, as you see. Uh, I know I lived here and also here. These are the main regions I know the very best, but I was traveling all around Kurdistan. Um, today I represent or coordinate the international relations of the Mesopotamia Ecology Movement on the international level. Um, there are not many who do this, there are few because uh, of the uh, political repression and the problems we have. So here first some pictures from Kurdistan to understand. The most parts are like this, mountainous, often forested. It's a half dry region. Here you see pictures. And the most parts are mountains like this. And on the north and east side, there are plateaus, high plateaus. And here's the famous Ararat mountain. It's high. Um, this is the city of Van also an historical city. And this landscape is uh, full of um, the cultural heritage, which goes five, six, seven, ten 10 years, years back as its upper Mesopotamia mainly. And here we see the city of Ahmed, which is called officially Diyarbakir. It's at the Tigris River. Here you see the, the famous fortress of Ahmed. So there are many, uh, the landscape is like this. And I will not explain much about Kurdistan. Uh, uh, and I assume that you know the basics about uh, Kurdistan to um, um, challenge the, the time of this presentation. Here's an image from Rojava, which is flat, the mountains in the back, this is in North Kurdistan. So we, these are the lower lands to the south. So Kurdistan has is quite, uh, quite diverse and the image of nomads, which are also part of the life in Kurdistan. There are not many anymore. This picture is probably 40 years old and it's more traditional anyway. So uh, Kurdistan, it's, let's say it's in each of the four states, Turkey, Iran, Iraq and Syria, let's say the and the periphery, uh, it's a colonial, it's considered as a colonial region and the states act like this, considered with a lot of repression. And the uh, repression exists in all the, the whole territory of the four states, but in Kurdistan, it's often a bit more uh, intensive, usually. So here you see a picture of dams, um, which ha have been started to be built in the, since the 70s. And uh, since the 50s, capitalism entered Kurdistan. So uh, the, the society and nature started to change quite, 
quite late compared to Europe or North America. It's more comparable with uh, countries of the global uh, south. Um, here is one of the many dams, big dams, the first big dam maybe in Kurdistan, really large dam. Uh, it was Keban, and this is Ataturk, the, which is bigger on the Euphrates River. You know, K Kurdistan originated the two big rivers, Euphrates and Tigris. You see this. And in this year's the states developed their policy, economy policy on Kurdistan with different uh, motivations and uh, strategies in each state a bit different. Anyway, so this as a background. Let's come to the 90s. In the 90s, the Kurdish Freedom Movement, mainly the Kurdistan Workers' Party, PKK, got mass movements in North Kurdistan. Millions of people started and joined this movement. To stop or to break this movement, the Turkish state torched also forests. So the forests, um, the 90s so much that uh, the most forests have been torched at least once. And uh, this, this went together with the destruction of almost 4,000 villages, up to 3 million people have been um, displaced. This is a huge intervention change, dramatic change uh, of the society and the landscape, the economy. Many things changed dramatically in the 90s. This was a, a one main reason why um, Abdullah Öcalan, the chairperson of the PKK, and started to change, uh, started to discuss issues also with the ecological perspective. So, like uh, uh, said, the state capitalism is so crazy that they can destroy huge landscapes, the life of people in a very brutal way. And uh, the people are disconnected more and more from the nature, they are concentrated more in the cities. This the movement started to get aware about the strategy, but PKK also followed the international discussion developments, especially the growing neoliberalism. Öcalan criticized neoliberal policies, how profit is more than ever possible. The issues of um, climate change had been discussed at the low level. Not level, level not so um, anyway, so these discussions were important, let's say for maybe some thousands of activists, not for the broad society of North Kurdistan, but uh, this was the first time thousands of activists got in touch with different ideas. Ecology, environmental policies, that wasn't no discussion in Kurdistan until the 90s. You could not find even the typical bourgeois environmental associations or so, nothing like this was existing until the 90s. So nobody cared uh, about these issues. So uh, then some of you remember, I'm sure in 99, the war between the guerrilla of PKK and the Turkish army stopped after Öcalan had been kidnapped. Uh, by the CIA and it has been handed over to Turkey. And since then, Öcalan is in prison, a solitary confinement at the island close to Istanbul. Um, when the, how to say, it stopped, a new phase started in Kurdistan, new political phase. There was no war anymore or almost no armed clashes. And uh, there was, at a short while, more space for society. The oppression became less, never disappeared. And this was also the moment when more and more big projects, investment projects, have been um, done by the state and private companies. And so protests started against, especially against dams. So it's mentioned again and again dam issue, but the dam and water issue is crucial, important, for let's say discussions uh, on ecological society, ecological life, 
in, in, in Kurdistan. So here you see the historical town of Hassan Kif, which is uh, since last year flooded by the Ilisu Dam. It's an older picture. There was a big struggle against the Ilisu Dam uh, in the beginning of 2000s. And it, thousands, you know, millions of people started to think about this. Uh, the Kurdish media, the Kurdish political organizations criticize this dam and other dams. And you must uh, consider that the majority of the society, let's say maybe 60% was close to the Kurdish freedom movement at that moment, 50 to 60, a slowly growing number. And the people were listening to this media and starting to discussing these issues. Say, hey, why we built so many projects all around our land? why we displaced hundreds of thousands of people. And this all for development. Is this development? Can we not get energy in a different way? Are there not alternatives? And so on. These were the first discussions. Uh, we are not always happy with all discussions, but they were going to the right direction. This is another case, more in the province of Dersim where the state starts to plan dams on this river. It's not a very large river, but a famous one. And the protest there was quite strong. Several times, 10,000s of people were protesting. So these were influencing also the discussions which started in 99, 2000, when Ojalan was kidnapped. He, uh, especially he was, he, his personality is important to understand the movement, of course, but he was the one who was pushing the most forward. Um, new discussion started about how, what kind of new strategy we can develop, uh, one which is more democratic, more inclusive, but also not reformist, a one which aims really uh, liberation, emancipation, equality. And this is what we aim in our, let's say, big goal. In the beginning of 2000s, mm, <clears throat> the proposal also from Ejelan, thousands, maybe 10,000s of activists started to read new books, new people, global thinkers. They started to discuss about former revolutions and how they develop um, global thinkers like Bookchin were important. Bookchin is, let's say, the most famous one among the ones uh, who were discussed and read at that time. Um, and also new political movements all around the world have been discussed. So it was a lot of discussion at that time. Uh, I remember quite well, and uh, this discussion actually continue. But to us, a time where the movement tried to find, the, let's say, the new way. It's also a result of the own practice. The movement became a mass movement, but they didn't succeed in the revolution and liberation. Um, problems came up, uh, internal conflicts, uh, and so on. Um, you should imagine that there was a guerrilla resistance. It means um, violence and this brings always, of course, it's legitimate because you fight against a state which denies you completely and doesn't accept anything, no space, but uh, it brings also problems with which you must uh, handle. So um, then the result was shortly democratic confederalism declared 2005. Blair mentioned it, the three pillars. Um, the first one is democracy, but democracy which goes beyond the representative democracy. That's why we often say the radical, the one which is uh, inclusive and it goes no, no ways how to organize society. And the second is uh, ecology. And we were actually surprised that this has been mentioned, ecologic life. And the third one, gender liberation. Um, and these three are interconnected. 
actually the movement starts to describe um, its new visions, aims, perspectives, always to the start of patriarchy. So that's why gender liberation is a very crucial issue for us. In the 19th, the discussion became very strong before uh, why the war was very going, going on intensively. The gender issue became very important. The women movement in Kurdistan became stronger and stronger. And uh, yes, it, actually uh, since then the women movement is growing and growing. And it's, I would say the most important today, the most, maybe, maybe the most, it's my opinion, uh, element which maintains the whole Kurdish freedom movement on a uh, pass which follows emancipation, emancipation uh, liberation, and aims to uh, kick back hierarchy and patriarchy and social exploitation. So, yes, um, anyway, ecology was very useful for us. We were very happy and this supported us. It was a time also when in Turkey, the AKP, the party which is still ruling and is led by Erdogan, and uh, was in power. It was a uh, had a, it was a very strong time for this party. The new the big new liberal wave spread all over the Turkish state, and it arrived also in North Kurdistan. Here you see two shopping malls in Ahmed. Ahmed's the biggest city, but we have shopping malls like this. Until then, we had only small shops and no big, almost no big change of supermarkets and so on. And this started to change uh, expression, how economy was changing with economy and social relations, more money was coming into the society. And this was a problem for, the, for our movement because more money, more profit starts to influence also people, more and more people in the Kurdish society. Actually the AKP wanted to uh, weaken the Kurdish freedom movement also with the money they were bringing. Uh, yes, um, but we discussed uh, the issues and never gave up and try to always make progress in our discussion and in our organization to be aware, to go always a step forward. Uh, for example, uh, we organized this ecology forum in 2011 because when we arrived in 2011, more and more ecology groups, ecological activists came out in North Kurdistan and also in Turkey. Actually in Turkey a bit in number, it's more in Turkey, uh, but also in Kurdistan. And uh, we said, okay, we must bring our discussions together. There are many groups fighting dams, fighting coal plants, big roads, mining, uh, fracking and so on, destruction by war and so on, and and um, urbanization, etc. Uh, we must bring our, we must bring our discussions together and develop a common perspective, what we want from an ecological perspective, and how to interrelate with others in the Kurdish society. So, uh, one thing at that time the say the climate crisis in Kurdistan, middle, all Middle East was growing and growing. This is one of the many maps you can find, less water and so on. Let's come back to North Kurdistan. 2010 was also a time where people, yes, after many years of discussion, especially young people, strengthened, especially the politically engaged, the ones who read and were organized and so on. And this is a big important number among the youth, uh, more than in, in Europe or North America, the, the scales are different. And they developed also an ecological perspective. Here's the protest against the destruction of a small forest. Actually this small forest it was successful and this changed many things in the head of the people. And small struggles like this were important. 
Here I want to mention the influence of the guerrilla, which was still existing in North Kurdistan. And because these are people who live in the mountains outside of capitalist relation, uh, based on solidarity, communality, and uh, yes, and they are, if you are out of the system and you live and produce and organize everything on a very different basis, with a different claim and approach, which you realize, then you have also different ideas. You think more free. So this is also an influence. The Kurdish society, important part, have a continuously in relation to the guerrilla. Anyway, 2012, the Mesopotamian College movement was initiated. And in the beginning, it was more network, but then it became stronger. The discussions continued. We said we must become really a movement. People are interested. So in two, with the beginning of 2015, new way started. We started to establish councils in each province. North Kurdistan has uh, 18 or so and councils open for groups and uh, individuals, everybody could uh, join it. Um, we are part uh, of the, uh, uh, we, of course, the other aspects, um, two pillars of democracy and gender liberation are also important for us. For example, we have, uh, we work, in, if we do something, organize ourselves, the gender perspective is crucial for us. Um, so every, let's say, position, representation or speaking position, there are always a man and a woman. And it's not only uh, for us, not only um, issue of men and women, genders, also sharing of responsibilities. Um, we uh organize ourselves that uh, every person can uh, contribute openly it takes also responsibility which change always uh, try to change positions um yes and uh, this is what we try with the many com commissions we have groups working groups etc we are part of the democratic society congress you can read it this is the umbrella structure of the Kurdish freedom movement in North Kurdistan. It still exists, despite the repression of the last four or five years. And um, in this umbrella structure, all the different movements, organizations, even parties, municipalities, small NGOs or so are represented, uh, which say, Democratic confederalism um, is our basis. We take this concept and we want to develop the democratic autonomy, an autonomy based on democracy. Autonomy is not a new word for political activists, but we combine it with democratic democracy. Uh, yes, um, so we are part of it. And there are diff very different people with different interests course, democratic, but not everybody is, let's say, kind of left radical or the feminist gender liberation, a strong gender liberation approach or a sense for an ecological life. Even also they say it, but they just are getting in touch with these ideas. So, and there are, um, how to say, big interest by organizations and not organizations, by a lot of people because you represent the majority of the society and there are different people from different social classes, not only working class, middle class, even some people from higher, not the highest, not the very richest, but they also try to get connected. Uh, uh, many different social classes are also part of it. So it's a complexity. So we interact in this uh, framework. So whatever for us is important, we bring it here into the discussion and step by step. And uh, we look for alias, especially the women movement, but there's also an economy movement. We set up mainly cooperatives. 
there were at least 40, 50, but now the number is less because of the repression. Uh, there's a use movement. These are very strong alias and uh, they are not against others, of course, but uh, they are, have a more sense for, let's say, ecological uh, perspective. So, uh, and in the 2000s, uh, understanding of eco being ecological and the Kurdish freedom movement and the practice, I mean, was to have, uh, to clean the cities, better garbage system, uh, more green areas in the cities, uh, reject big dams and these issues, but it's, it's of course not enough for an ecological perspective. So our aim is to, uh, how to say, to have a, we want that like uh, the uh, Kurdish women movement has achieved it for a big part. We want that the ecological perspective, um, the ecology, cr ecology criteria are taken seriously by everybody in the uh, Kurdish freedom movement, whatever you do, whatever you discuss or take decision, uh, you must really um, um, uh, take uh, ecology seriously. This is what we want to aim. Um, anyway, let's continue. So uh, here you see a picture from the Mesopotamia uh, ecology movement. We did an action in this old town of Hassan Cave with hundreds of people. In 2015, hundreds of people joined us, maybe one, 2,000. So uh, we, it was a big wave, we didn't expect it. And 2015 summer, the war started again in North Kurdistan. The Turkish state stopped the negotiations with the Kurdish freedom movement. They were going on for two and a half years. And they stopped it and started the war because they were thinking very likely that they are losing if they speak about peace. And the peace times, we didn't lose. So actually in the peace times in North Kurdistan, our movement could become stronger. Not only in the elections, I mean all the movements in 2013, 14, 15, as I said, the economy movement grew, the youth movement grew, and there are many others. And one on health, on education, and others, they all organize themselves, use this time. And the state said, very likely, no, no, it's not good for me. I must make war and uh, count again on nationalism. So then we started to look to the, also the forest fires, a, which the state does towards the forest when they start fighting the Kurds, Kurdish people. Here you see a picture of the, one of our congresses. Uh, as I said, what we do, we struggle against big infrastructure projects in the rural areas and the urban areas. Um, then we um, uh, work uh, campaign against destruction by war. Uh, forest fires are ones, but also destruction of livelihood. And another one is, of course, alternative projects not only be stopped destruction, uh, build the alternative. Uh, I think you, you know all this, the slogan, but we wanted to do it and we work on it. It's hard, but uh, we started early projects like this. Education is for us important, permanent education. This is for us important, uh, for us with others, with other movements in the British freedom movement, with other ecology movements also in Turkey, and one special focus are the municipalities, uh, which the Kurdish Freedom Movement, the legal party of the Kurdish Freedom Movement, could win for a big part since 1999. And they are local power and they are connected to the state. And you can imagine that alienation, problem, uh, corruption, not on a high level, but are uh, issues where which with which you have to deal. And there are municipalities, there are projects which are sometimes problematic. In few time, few cases, we did even demonstrations against it. Here's one picture of, uh, uh, we say, um, workshops we did. In summer it's very hot so outside. These are friends. So we have a picture of the people who about whom I'm speaking. These are all friends. 
So uh, we work with the refugees. It's a refugee camp. The people came from North Iraq, South Kurdistan. These are the EZDs. We build up a seat conservation here. Then we collected seat in our region, the local, dynamic, and organic, and we replanted around the cities where the most people live. And we included, for example, the uh, I would say the neighborhood councils. These are structures, part of the Democratic Society Congress. They have been set up since, uh, since 2007. People from the neighborhoods doing direct democracy and we include them and planted it with them together. So it has, can contain, uh, continue to exist. So we initiate it, but then give it to them. Before, of course, we speak to them. So projects like this here, it's something about water, drinking water issues for children. And here's uh, one of the few cooperatives which we have at, uh, let's say, at a collective on agriculture. Friends have started it. They plant mainly um, vegetables. They built also these traditional houses, Kurdistan, with some new technologies. Actually, they're relearn it and they try to improve it. So friends try to do this. This is the first one. Since then, the friends could build four or five more of these houses anyway. So we have also a tree nursery. This is a picture of the tree nursery. And there's also a tree nursery by the Make Rojava Green Again campaign, only for information. Uh, we have also one, but it's not, so we don't make it so much public. Yes, um, before I come to the relation with the uh, Turkish uh, Middle East groups, uh, I want to say we have one interesting discussion, uh, which would I like to mention. It's at the definition of uh, ecological industry. So we say we must uh, develop an ecological society, generally ecologically democratic, uh, especially for the ecological aim, uh, the economy is crucial. Without an uh, ecological economy, uh, without the economy of solidarity, which is based also on ecological principles, it's not possible. Because, um, an hierarchical, monopolist, capitalist, neoliberal economy destroys our livelihoods, nature, and, and the people and the life as a rule. So there's a discussion how to re, re change, reform, reorganize industry in a way which serves people and life. Uh, it's a big discussion. We are at the beginning. We have not much, uh, not a big concept, but we discuss it from this uh, perspective. Yeah, and um, we'll take it. This is a picture two years old or three years, meanwhile, almost. This is the first, let's say, ecology network of uh, organizations in North Kurdistan and uh, Turkey, actually all the state of Turkey, 52 groups. From the very beginning on, we joined it and joined it, of course. And uh, it took a long time that the ecology groups or the groups working on ecology related issues a very different kind of groups came together. It's the first time. It's, it's a hard issue. We tried it 10 years ago and so on, but never worked. Now it works. So not all are represented, but uh, the most one. And so um, a tool where we cooperate better with the people in North and West and Middle of Turkey. Um, the relations have become better in the last seven, eight years, especially. In the 2000s was more problematic because of Turkish nationalism. Now it's much better. Yeah, and uh, it's called the Just Ecology Union. You see the logo. In 2019, only to mention, there was again a, the last strong campaign wave against Eli Sudan. Here we did actions to jump into the water all around the world. You see some pictures. This one is from uh, Kurdistan, West Turkey, South Turkey, and so on, Netherlands, Germany. 
And uh, there was a big campaign and also um, several Turkish ecology groups, activists joined it. It was a good one, but it was not enough to stop the illicit dam, unfortunately. There are a bit, um, other, Actually, I'm ending, yes. Yeah. Yes, I'm ending. I'm only 40 minutes or so. Okay, I'm ending here. So these are pictures from two big discussions in Turkey, only to mention this is here. There's a mountain called Ida. There's a mining project. It's now an internationally. So we are in relation with many of these groups working again this. So we show solidarity to each other. And this is a Canal Istanbul project, the most crazy project in Turkey, the government wants to do. So we work with them and it's getting better. It's not always like we want. The, as many of the Turkish groups, they are careful when they cooperate with us uh, or publicly because they say that the nationalism is so strong, the repression is so strong. We have repression, but if we uh, are too close to you, to, to you too often, the pressure on us can be stronger or some of the members don't want it anyway. So this is one issue. Yeah, this is a call against invasion of Rojava in 2019. We have initiated and 100 organizations all around the world to join it from an ecology perspective. We work also towards the last slide uh, and the Mesopotamia region, the other regions, actually Middle East. Um, this is the first Mesopotamia water forum organized almost two years ago in South Kurdistan, Iraqi Kurdistan. But there are many Kurdish, Arabic, Persian groups. Uh, we could come together. It was a challenge. We work, still work together. Um, so we say the Euphrates, Tigris, and other territories connect us. We can work together for a more ecological, social life, for a peaceful life. Don't use water as a weapon. And this is a way where people can come together. You must think that the borders are really borders. You can make trade, but the exchange of ideas and uh, movements is much, much more uh, challenging. Anyway, and these are some links uh, where you can get more information also in English mainly. Yes, and at this point, I want to thank you. It was 10 minutes too long, I'm sorry. Um, Yes, I'm happy now to listen to Vian and then we have the discussion. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ashan. Um, that's great. Uh, I'm sure people have lots of questions. Uh, so hopefully we will still have time to get to some and I will pass straight over to Vian so that we can, um, yeah, uh, listen to uh, their experience of working in Rojava. Aya, thanks for having me. Um, as Katie said in the introduction, I'm an internationalist within the Kurdish freedom movement, and I worked with the movement in Northeast Syria, including the Make Rojava Green Again campaign for a year before coming back to the UK, where I'm based um, just under a year ago. So I'm filling in for a friend, Ronia, who works with Make Rojava Green Again, who had to drop out last minute. So um, forgive me for any chaos and disorganization. I'm not so organized as Erjan to have all the slides set up. But I will speak for a little while and then I'll show some pictures um, in that order, if that's all right. So um, I come from an ecological background in terms of political organizing and in terms of the work that I do. I've been involved in climate change campaigns um, as well as running urban food growing projects, uh, growing veg and flowers and working in the food sovereignty world. So this was a big area of interest for me coming to Rojava. Um, and so in 2019, I packed up my life in the UK and went to Rojava to join the revolutionary movement and to learn from the movement in terms of how they've achieved such amazing successes at a time that many of our social movements in the West are really struggling um, to gain ground and also to support the ecological aspects of the revolution, as well as walking a path in the memory of an old friend of mine, Anna Campbell, who was killed by a Turkish airstrike in Rojava in 2018. 
Uh, so going to Rojava to sort of keep on walking that path felt quite important for me on a personal level. So I ended up working in the internationalist commune for a while on the Make Rojava Green Again campaign, uh, working on the tree nursery, doing tree planting projects, tending vegetable gardens. And throughout this time and my whole time in Rojava, I was able to um, I was really lucky to be able to travel around Northeast Syria, see dozens of ecological projects, um, co-ops, get stuck into some of them, um, at academies and universities which are focusing on ecological issues. So it was really amazing and really humbling to see the amount of work that's happening across Northeast Syria on ecology, even though many people will acknowledge that as one of the pillars of the revolution, it's, um, it's the one that's kind of almost struggling the most because of various issues that I'll speak about a bit more later. Um, so I spent some time um, in Genoir, the women's village, but not so long, mostly just sort of a few visits and so on, and also some time at the Andre Wolf Academy, which is a women's academy that has an international focus that is a center for the science of women's genealogy. Um, and so what I'm going to try to talk about a little bit this time is specifically Genoir, the women's village. Um, Jin means women and war is like the place of the village of. Uh, and how that combination of collective living, um, community, collective economy, democracy, ecology, and women's liberation fit together in the paradigm of the movement. Um, I've spoken before at an Institute for Social Ecology event, so I'm really happy to be back. And this time it's going to be a lot more looking about the practical ecological aspects and trying to kind of bring it to life and paint a bit of a picture. And I'm very honored to be following Erjan in this event. And it's just so important to draw those connections between Rojava and Bakur. So Northern Kurdistan in Southeast Turkey, because <clears throat> they're completely interlinked. And if we want to defend the movement, if we want to defend Rojava, we need to support the movement in Bakur, <clears throat> Southeast Turkey, and also fight against Turkish state fascism. Um, so it's really one struggle that we need to be uh, aligned with and, and part of in our work. So Genoir is uh, the women's village, uh, which has received actually a huge amount of international attention in the press because it really captures the imagination. It's a place where women build up uh, a sort of self-determined and collective life based on ecological principles. It's not super big. I think it's something like under 20 families, lots of children, um, but it's just had such a huge impact on the, I guess, you know, both local but also global consciousness about kind of what's possible under these conditions in Rojava, um, what, what opportunities are opened up when we try doing things in different, radically different ways. Uh, a lot of the initiative and organization came from the women's movement of Rojava, but the vision really right now is held and driven by the women who live there uh, with their children. So it's based on an ecological understanding of women's liberation. So that's really seeing ecology not just as planting trees, so not as an issue, but like as a whole mindset, as a whole worldview and approach. So it's not just about we have renewable energy or we grow our own vegetables. It's also about how we live together. So one of the principles of the women's movement, which is called Hevjiana Azad, which translates roughly into free communal or collective life, um, is really central to this thing that's driving Genoir. So to understand Genoir as an ecological project, you need to also understand it as a project in communalism, in autonomy, in women's liberation. Um, so it's important to also, or it's interesting to remember that Jin, which means women in Kurdish, and Jian, which means life in Kurdish, um, have the same root. So the movement really sees a strong connection between women's liberation and ecology. So that can be, you know, interpreted in lots of different ways. But as a sort of fundamental bottom line, you can say that the analysis is that the destruction of nature is a patriarchal dynamic in a lot of ways. And by having a women's village, you create a really fertile space for being able to recreate a relationship with nature and with community and with yourself um, in a way which is, is to an extent, at least free from patriarchy. Um, and that's why it's so, so amazing to be there. And it's a really beautiful space. So that ecology is a balance between society and nature, 
a balance in the relationships between us and the world around us and just seeing everything as connected and everything alive and connecting to ourselves um, and seeing ourselves as part of nature which you know social ecology has such a great framework for so then therefore seeing ecological work and also defense of nature is actually a form of self-defense um, not as that we're defending nature but we are defending ourselves because we are nature and nature is us um, so with this kind of ecology of the human being it's really focusing on the fact that there there is no individual absent from the collective in nature humans are collective creatures we live in community um, and therefore our liberation needs to come through community and so jinwa is a place where that community is created and therefore that liberation becomes a little bit more possible and of course, I mean, you guys are coming to an Institute of Social Ecology talk. You guys probably know a lot more about social ecology than I do. Um, and the impact of Bookchin on Ochilan and the Kurdish freedom movement is really significant. Um, but I guess I would want to sort of ask you guys to at least take a step back from that and to also look kind of more broadly um, at what the revolution is and recognizing that although Bookchin's social ecology was one of the many seeds that has you know, fertilized this amazing movement, it's only one. And the soil in which it grows is Kurdistan, it is the Kurdish freedom movement. Um, and there's loads of other ideas that have made it possible for the amazing, amazing achievements of the revolution to happen, such as you know, the history of anti-colonial struggle against the Turkish state, um, the socialist guerrilla movement in the PKK, and the centering of women's liberation. So that's really, part of the foundation, the, the whole foundation even. Um, so if we want to really learn from and take an example from what's happening in Kurdistan, we do need to see that kind of whole picture and not just kind of think of it as a through, the, through our lens that we're coming to it with. So the way that life in Genoir is lived seeks to develop life with an ecological understanding and building ecological relationships. So First of all, how is the village built? Um, it's built using ecological architecture, so using traditional uh, mud bricks that are, you know, dug up from the ground and then dried in the sun and then assembled. And as I'm sure most of you know, this then creates a much more sort of ecologically sound structure, which is cooler in the summer, warmer in the winter, it can breathe more easily. And at a time when lots of new buildings in Rojava are made with cement, um, it creates a sort of bridge between the traditional methods of architecture of the region and then what's the future in terms of ecological building. Um, the, even before the construction work started on the village, which was built by the women and the women from the movement to, to build it up as opposed to bringing in, you know, hired labor, um, trees were planted and the garden was built and work was being done to regenerate the soil. So that relationship with the land was put at, as a really central part of even building up the village itself. So a lot of women are coming to the village with experience in agricultural work and gardening and so on, but some are coming without that and they're all learning new things as well. Um, and that's part of the process of it. So for example, they've uh, now created a village bakery in which the women bake their own bread as well as sell it to local villages. And that was a skill that not many of the women had coming in. Um, and a lot of the women as well are sort of breaking a lot of um, social conventions and like learning how to drive tractors and so on in order to have that autonomy over their village, their community and their economy. Um, so it's having a real impact on the lives of women there and being a bit of an example for women all around. And there's also a lot of mutual support and exchange with neighboring villages too. It's not a bubble that exists as this sort of like perfect utopia. It is very much part of the social fabric of the whole region. In terms of who lives in Genoa, it's made up of women from lots of different walks of life, so different ethnicities. There are Kurdish women, there's Arab women, um, different ages, different family situations. There's a lot of children as well. Um, and some women come because They've never married and want to live in a community with women. Some came to escape domestic violence, uh, non-consensual marriages. Others come as widows as well, and many will bring their children, but not all of them. And there's also internationalist volunteers who come and stay for periods of time in Genoir, and they take part of village life as every other woman does there too. So it's entirely self-organized. 
there's different houses for the different households so it's not like everybody lives in one big building but there's a lot of collective responsibilities um, and sort of democratic structures that bring people together in order to really weave those connections and so on. So some women take care of the sheep, other works in the garden, um, others work in the bakery. And then when there's a really big thing of work that needs to happen, like harvesting vegetables or processing um, harvest and so on, then all the women come together and sit together and chat and sing and tell stories and do, do the work like every evening pulling the seeds out of sunflowers or preserving food when there's a glut of tomatoes, for example, um, and that becomes a communal effort. So through this process, there's kind of no alienation from nature. You know, the women in the village live very much alongside and part of nature. Um, they All the works are treated as equal. The women who work in the bakery or who work in the shop aren't seen as higher or lower than the women who work in the fields or who tend to the sheep. So it's kind of creating that democratic feeling as well because they can all really see that they're very necessary for each other. Um, and so here we kind of see social ecology as a bit of a practice. And it's really important that it is a, a you know, physical, embodied, emotional practice. It's not an academic field. It's not an intellectual exercise. It's something that's really lived. And through this work and this way of life, they can actually really give meaning to the, the gifts of the natural world that they're able to live off of, um, which is not so possible if you just think of it as an idea and not an actual way of living life. And the aim is that all the women who come to Jinwar are able to build up this connection to the land and to nature um, and for that kind of ecology of, of human and the natural world to become visible and lived. Um, and so it's also a place of education and celebration and healing. So, you know, women will come there for events, for seminars um, and meetings, conferences, parties. So then it also spreads the impact, so even though it's quite a small project in itself, again, the ripples are really huge. Every couple of weeks, there's a small assembly um, so that the women come together, they speak about how their life is going. So they're seeing each other day to day through the work, but then they kind of set aside intentional time to come together. How's the work going? What's been difficult? Um, what have we struggled with? What do we need? How will we improve our works? Um, and so then there's also not only no alienation from nature, but there's also no alienation from each other. So affirming the idea that, you know, through community, we become whole humans, we become whole individuals only when put in a collective and that our fragmentation into individuals is part of our oppression, which is something that as people in the West, we really experience probably the most out of, you know, anyone in the world that we've been really individualized and really fragmented from each other and alienated from each other. And then so in order to resist and in order to build a, a, a free beautiful life, we need to do it together and to collectively struggle for it as well. And that informs the way that the economy of the village is set up. So the economic perspective aims to be ecological. There's a communal economy for the whole village where the labor of women is central to the village and the yields of the vegetable garden, the fields, the herd animals, the fruit trees and olive trees all go towards the self-sufficiency of the village. Nobody makes a private property out of it. Nobody gets to take more than other people because of their class or financial position. Everyone gets what they need um, based on how many people live in the household. Um, and there's a village shop for basic needs for nearby villages. And in the bakery, they bake bread that's made out of the flour that's produced on site. And um, every woman gets part of the common income, so kind of cash income every every month, as well as having vegetables from the gardens and once a month sort of staples like dried pulses and kind of tahini and oils and things like that. And then that income also pays for basic costs like having, you know, the mini bus that drives people around and electricity. And as Ella John said, like it's not an anti-technology or an anti-industry stance. It's about eco-industry. It's about finding ways to live with technology, which is sustainable and strengthens kind of our collective life as opposed to strengthening the profit of individuals. Um, and as with um, the situation in Bakur, um, Northern Kurdistan, 
like these issues are really affected by largely the Turkish state, but the general geopolitical situation. So um, the situations of war and embargo on the region of Northeast Syria have a really big impact on how successful these projects can be. Um, there have been a lot of work to you know, set up this, for example, there's solar panels in Genoir. There was a big project to implement more solar panels and to bring other forms of renewable energy into the village. But then those had to be abandoned um, because of the Turkish invasion in 2019. And then the village had to be temporarily evacuated, you know, and they had to you know, figure out what to do with the, the crops and the animals and everything. And that was a huge disruption on the, you know, the, the economic and, and physical life of the women and children, not to mention the you know, emotional and psychological impact of that as well. Um, so again, it's really important to think that, you know, how do we support these amazing projects in Rojava and across all of Kurdistan? Part of it is about, you know, looking at the at what's threatening them. And that is largely Turkish state fascism and, and Turkish attacks. Um, and so Genoir is just a really important place to develop this approach a bit further. It's not a finished product. It's not perfect. There's mechanisms for reflection and, you know, evaluation and improvement and adjustment, um, but that's an ongoing process and it faces the same challenges that a lot of other projects that are so ambitious and working with humans, you know, who are difficult creatures um, have. Um, but at the same time, there's a real will to keep on working on these issues, to keep on finding solutions and to keep on being part of this constant building up of this consciousness, of confidence, of engagement, of education, um, and to really link it to the bigger picture of the wider movement. And I think that's something I'd really like to lift up, like what stops this from being lifestyleism? What stops it from being a sort of self-involved commune project that doesn't actually fundamentally change the fabric of society and our understanding of what we see as possible in the world. If we think about a lot of, not all, but a lot of land projects, kind of communal living projects in the countryside in the West, certainly in the UK and America, which I'm most familiar with, a lot of them are really cut off from wider political struggle, from wider society and community initiatives. Um, so what stops it from from not just falling into this trap of essentially lifestyleism. And I think the fact that it's really holistic, so it's based on ecology and community practice. It's underpinned by a worldview based on freedom and democracy and justice. And that's really a non-negotiable in the foundation of the village. Um, so it stops it from being kind of co-opted by a more neoliberal approach in the way that a lot of our ecological or feminist projects um, in the West do. And I think that's really important to think about the work that we do here on ecology as well. How do we make it holistic and how do we make it tied into a wider revolutionary worldview instead of something that can be co-opted by neoliberalism? Um, so Genoir is just one example out of just dozens and dozens of ecological projects and kind of campaigns and work in uh, northeast Syria and Rojava. So there's, for example, Jaludi village, which is a, a village that does a collective village economy who grow crops together, have set up a community garden. Um, that's really an amazing example of, of people coming together across lots of different families and divides and rivalries in order to build up an ecological life. There's lots of cooperatives, tree nurseries, orchards, arable projects, horticultural projects. Um, and involvement of internationalists like myself in those projects, but also dozens of projects where no internationalist ever shows up, no one shows up with a camera, so like no one even knows it's happening in a lot of ways, um, but it is. And there's a lot of projects and initiatives coming out of the municipalities in order to, for example, like develop a ecological water treatment system or a proper recycling system, because right now a lot of the trash is either dumped or burned. Um, and these projects have been scoped out, costed, 
um, planned out, but no one is able to get the funding for them or they're not able to get the parts to actually build the water treatment facilities because of the situation um, economically and geopolitically. Um, Rojava Information Center produced an interesting report about why it's so hard to get international aid and development aid to Northeast Syria because of the situation of the administration. Um, and I think that's a really interesting lens to, to bear in mind that actually a lot of development aid funding is not making its northeast Syria because it's not a state actor and the Assad regime is just channeling a lot of funds away. Um, so I'm going to just show a few pictures for a couple of minutes before handing back over. Um, so let me do the screen share thing um, just because I think it's really nice to be able to visualize it a bit more. Are you guys seeing that okay? Yeah, cool. Thank you. Um, so that's just a little snapshot of the houses in Genoir. So as you can see, they're built using this traditional clay method. Some of them have this dome on the top, which really helps with sort of air circulation and temperature control inside. Um, and this is sort of the other side of the village during one of the sort of drier months, so it's not as picturesque, but I can definitely vouch for the fact that they are much cooler and more pleasant to be in than a lot of other buildings in Rojava because I was really sick um, while I was there because I got parasites and then they sent me to Jinwar to recover and it was just such a blessing to be sort of kind of carried, half carried into this beautiful, cool building in the heat of like July Syrian summer. So they are really amazing and also, yeah, really reduce the need for um, electricity, air conditioning and so on. Um, so here we see the solar panels, which have been installed on one of the rooftops of the community hall building. And just as a disclaimer, some of these are photos that friends um, in Rojava sent to me, and some of them I just got from the internet because I was a bit pushed for time. So I don't own the rights to all these photos, um, but they're lovely. So <laughs> here they are. Um, and yeah, tree planting is a huge thing all across, across Rojava, definitely in Genoir. This is a sort of tree planting um, in Genoir where two women from the YPG are helping out. And this was uh, part of the actual construction of the village uh, with the mud bricks that had been dried in the sun previously. And these are just sort of like candid shots of people you know, clearing fields, um, doing gardening, and as you can see, like that engagement with the natural world, with the work it takes to make a piece of land fertile and fruitful is a really normal part of daily life. Like, you know, the kids are there hanging out. Um, this is something that you do, you, know, you have a cup of tea while you're doing it. Like, it's very much just part of the fabric of daily life there. And I know that somebody put in the chat a question about, you know, cities and ecology and rethinking our relationship with the city. Um, there is something important about, because it's a village, it's more integrated with ecological life. And, and that is a perspective that a lot of people um, from the movement have in terms of reconnecting with that connection um, through village life. And yeah, ecology is just very much part of day-to-day -day life, people have, you know, flowers and herbs and salads in front of their houses, the fields, yeah, get prepared by the women, um, the sheep are wandering around everywhere most of the time, and then when there's bigger pieces of work to do, a lot of women will get together and get it done together. And then this is a seminar, I think a genealogy, science of women seminar that's being given at Genoir, where women from Genoir will attend, but also lots of women from outside. So again, it, it makes it into this sort of um, social and intellectual hub of Rojava as well. And this is a women's uh, health center that's been set up in Genoir more recently over the past year. Um, so that's on site and they look a lot at I guess, different holistic herbal remedies and so on, and seeing the body as something that exists in a less kind of Western scientific way, but having more holistic approach to health, um, including looking at the social and political conditions in which we live um, and seeing that as having a real impact on our mental, emotional and physical well-being. And this is, yeah, a celebration that I think was from the opening of the 
health center. So it's also a place for, yeah, for joy and celebration too. Um, so that's most of what I wanted to kind of bring up and just to reflect on that, you know, this is part of the revolution. And we often think of revolution as being fought with weapons, but you know, a lot of the revolution won't be won with weapons. It's gonna be won with mentality and changing the mentality of, of how we see what's possible, how we live, how we build society, how we relate to each other and to the world we live in. And this is the most important, but it's also the hardest work. So when we think about you know, what we do in the USA, in the UK, the West, Europe in general, uh, you know, what stops us from having an ecological mentality and things like individualism, capitalist competition, colonialism, imperialism, white supremacy, like these are all things that stop us from re being able to live ecological life. It's not just the lack of a piece of land, it's also all these things inside us. So we need to become more aware of that, to analyze it, to work on it, not just as intellectual exercise or not on our own, but like through practice and through collective work and kind of look at look for examples of different ways of living and being and different ways of relating to the natural world and to community and to economy. So part of that means, yes, looking at Kurdistan and drawing strength and inspiration from the movements there, and also looking at you know, indigenous communities, black liberation movements, feminist and queer organizing, and the Kurdish movement organizing where we live as well, and looking to those for examples, for strength, for a collective with which to struggle. Um, and through that, we'll be able to you know, kind of create a genoir everywhere, um, wherever we are. So thank you very much. I'm gonna hand back over to uh, Katie to facilitate the questions. Thanks, Fian. Thank you both, uh, to both our speakers. It's been really great uh, listening to such a variety of different perspectives that that like really hyper local community level, but also thinking about the region um, and the broader struggles that are going on there. Um, so uh, uh, we're running a little bit over time, uh, but there are lots of questions and we do want to try and make um, uh, make sure we get to address some of them. So um, hopefully people um, won't mind if we run over by 10 minutes or so, but if you need to leave, that's totally fine. Um, I, um, I'm going to try and group some of the questions um, uh, together so that, so that uh, yeah, so that we can like maybe address um, a few themes. Um, so as this is uh, an Institute for Social Ecology event, um, uh, and Vian mentioned it actually as well about um, uh, Bookchin's writings about um, uh, urban spaces and rethinking uh, the relationship between cities and nature and how important that is. So um, yeah, maybe this is for both of you actually, just kind of a question around um, what thinking um, has been done along those lines and has that kind of uh, changed very much since, since the revolution, like uh, people's understanding of the need to like, uh, think about urban spaces with with ecology in mind um, and and also a, a kind of related question about other ecological thinkers paradigms schools of thought that have ha had an influence on the, on the revolution as well as Murray Bookchin so I don't know if either of you could um, respond to those Maybe I can make a short response and then pass over. Um, sure. So, I mean, as I mentioned, like the village is seen as a really important place um, for ecological connection, but it's not that cities are seen as places without any connection to nature or environmentalism. And, you know, there's the cities are full of gardens and parks. And one of the projects we were involved in in Make Rajava Green again was actually working with local communities to set up community gardens, set up community tree nurseries, and to sort of reclaim um, the banks of the river that went through the city of Derrick into a beautiful green space. And just one thing I really noticed is that in general, um, people go outside to have a cup of tea, to have a snack, to have a picnic with their family or with their friends on a really regular basis. Like even in what we would consider to be like, oh, that's not a very nice place to sit. Like people go outside in nature in a very kind of normal way, in a casual way. And I think, you know, rather than pointing at a sort of academic or, or 
theorist who has a theory of ecology, I would also say there's something in the culture too about the importance of nature and the connection to nature. Um, and that's been a really important um, influence, I think, in terms of the, the readiness which with which I've seen a lot of people kind of embrace the, the ecological aspects of the revolution. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can also add, uh, I hope I got the question. Um, <clears throat> Um, we in North Kurdistan, we have uh, bigger cities than in Rojava. We have a bigger population, but the biggest city has, fortunately, not more than one million people, but it's actually it's already too much. And we have discussed and discussed uh, if the political conditions allow better. Uh, we never know how long this period of repression continues. Um, how to transform cities in an ecological and social way to make cities more a uh, place of solidarity. Actually, there is a certain solidarity, but uh, the cities have become more uh, intensive. I mean, more people live in a certain space and uh, certain alienation in the bigger cities is occurring, is happening. Um, the make a cities, transform cities, of course, with more green areas, with a better public transport, uh, with more public spaces, of course, social centers and so on. But we think more uh, how to organize uh, the society, if you organize society more in a democratic way, in councils and communes, uh, this is a first step to transform cities in a more democratic way, social and ecological. Now that this is a basis, actually, uh, we can discuss, think how to change uh, cities, but in the end, at the ground, the people, uh, organized people should do it. But if, um, yeah, there are a lot of ideas. How What we do sometimes, what we have done is, uh, so when planning new buildings, I mean, there are constantly, continuously new buildings are built, how they can be built in a more social way. In the last 20, 25 years, there have been built uh, a lot of buildings in a West End, very capitalistic way. Uh, how to um, ch change this development. So we, we um, also architects, sociologists, they, we have started, friends have started to create first working groups to discuss it also with people from the municipalities. So there are discussions and efforts uh, to do it, uh, to, to, to stand against this development, which is imposed by the capitalist structures of the Tur in the Turkish state. Um, we are trying to counter I would say counter, countering this. Yeah, this is our discussion at this moment. And there are not current, not really big projects or so, but discussions are there. And uh, yeah, they are sometimes very interesting, but they have not developed enough at this point. But uh, in the future, this is where it's possible. Uh. Thanks, both of you. Um, so uh, a question about the kind of current uh, moment, I guess, um, um, from Stephen is how has Make Rojava Green Again fared during the year of coronavirus and intensified attacks from the Turkish state? So I guess that's from 2019, continuing till today. Um, and also a related thing from Brian about um, you know, the broader context of the political situation for Kurdish organizers in Turkey, especially, um, and thinking about um, Erdogan's crackdowns, arrests, things like this. So in that kind of context, what projects are able to be taken forward? What, what other priorities? Again, like either of you or both of you, if you want to come in. Erdogan, maybe you first. Uh, sorry, you're you're on uh, mute. Ah, I didn't listen to the last sentence because I started to read something. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. I was confused. 
it was just about um the the kind of the challenges i guess um in taking ecological projects forward both um in the context of coronavirus um and also thinking about intensified attacks um in the region both military but also politically from from um state repression so kind of in that context what 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 does that mean for ecological self defense um I mean, the political repression by the Turkish state never became less because of the coronavirus. And um, the, they never stopped to arrest people, to attack uh, demonstrations or any kind of activities. Um, say, uh, attack also projects and it, it, Maybe in a few cases the state even used the situation, uh, abused it, and it didn't allow any kind of protests and demonstrations in North Kurdistan. It was very hard. Only the last summer, some were possible. Um, so um, the Turk state, in general, it doesn't take care really about the health uh, of, the, of its population. And maybe in Kurdistan, uh, it's even worse. Um, and while, I mean, there are parts of the population and the ecologists and activists, especially the organized people, maybe they are more, they're taking the virus more seriously um, because of the organization of the structures of being political they follow the discussion and see this as a big health risk, but part of the population that don't do, and for partly it's also impossible for them to do if they had they had to work. And we had hard lockdowns in Turkey and North Kurdistan, but it never affect factories or uh, or uh, big companies or small companies. They could all they continued always. To, to, to work and the state um, never looked to any, um, how to say, it didn't care whether the working place uh, measurements have been taken. So the number of uh, affected people by the virus is extremely high in North Kurdistan. Uh, half of my friends, they had the virus already they are younger and they could survive it, but their parents or so grandparents, many of them died. Um, it's big hard. Uh, our ecology projects, I mean, we couldn't do any protest organizations during the year, almost impossible. It affected us, but we continued with our uh, cooperatives or so our meetings, but it, they had to be more, let's say, more carefully and. Uh, they, the, let's say the state used each each uh, uh, opportunity or excuse to to increase their oppression. Yeah, and I think in many ways, you know, the attacks of the Turkish state um, in Rojava have had such a clear effect um, from the invasion and ongoing occupation of Afrin in 2018 to the invasion and ongoing occupation of the area um, between Serekanye and Talabyad um, a year ago or, you know, in 2019, like, these areas on a very technical level hold a lot of olive groves, arable area, a lot of cooperatives and the number of now functioning ecolo ecological projects and cooperatives has been drastically cut because now there's essentially many, you know, militias, Turkish backed militias, many of whom are jihadist and brutally patriarchal and anti-Kurdish um, occupying these spaces that used to be places where there were you know fruit growing projects and you know film projects and women's houses and academies um so that has a really big effect um 
we were organizing an agroecological delegation to come to Rojava in October 2019, which then was canceled because of the invasion. Um, you know, I ended up doing press work because I'm a native English speaker instead of doing ecological work, um, you know, because of the invasion. And you know, that's just a tiny, tiny example of the impact it had on millions of people who were made into refugees, who were displaced, who lost their homes, who were killed. So I think, you know, it's really huge and you can't underestimate it. And with coronavirus, it's also a huge effect. Um, the health infrastructure isn't as strong as it could be because of a lot of impact of funding embargo, how international aid funding works, the closing of humanitarian aid crossings into North and East Syria by the United Nations. You know, like there's a lot of obstacles which have stopped Northeast Syria from being able to effectively um, tackle and control coronavirus. And also fundamentally, there's been such an economic crisis because of the situation of the Syrian pound that people need to work. They need to be able to buy bread and food to, you know, to feed their families. And so it's kind of impossible to keep people at home as well. So then the virus goes uncontrolled. The virus has spread throughout the refugee population region of Shekhba, where um, tens of thousands um, of refugees from the Afrin region are living, you know, and in those often quite cramped conditions, the virus can just, you know, spread like wildfire. So it's had a really huge effect. And, you know, I'll, I'll stop there, I can go on. But what's more important is what we do about it and how we actually stand with the people of Kurdistan and stand with the revolution and do what we can to both provide you know, support and solidarity to the projects and the work and the movement over there to fight against the the ways in which our own governments and the corporations which are based in our countries are, you know, complicit in everything that's happening, whether it's arms companies or other corporations, it's our governments. Um, and there's so much that we can do here. And I, I do think I've, I very strongly support internationalists going to um, Kurdistan in order to draw on the strength and wisdom and analysis and power of the movement there. Um, but even for those who don't travel over, um, I think there's just a huge amount of stuff we can do here. Okay, that ties really nicely with, um, really nicely, sorry, with the next uh, question, which is hopefully a good place to try and kind of wrap up and, and bring things to some kind of close but it, um, yeah if both of you could speak a, uh, a little bit about what kind of solidarity actions would strengthen uh, the work that's happening um, in Rojava. Um, there's a question Cora, uh, from, uh, from Cora for Ershan I think about specifically what actions would strengthen the Mesopotamia ecological movement um, so perhaps yes if you could talk about that Ershan and maybe um, Vianne as well I know you're based obviously uh, where I am so you might have some <laughs> reflections to share about movements um, uh, over here and what we can do. Shall I start? Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, in terms of solidarity, is always a question which comes. Um, I mean, um, one thing is uh, always to to inform yourself, follow the discussion, uh, read, and get in contact with people working on Kurdistan. Um, but in terms of the ecology movement, uh, the Mesopotamia ecology movement, maybe the first two things comes in my mind is uh, we have, the, uh, I showed you two, three cooperatives, they work in Kurdistan. Maybe there's, if you think uh, you can add something there, you can get contacted with them. I guess somebody wrote permaculture and I, as I know, one, two friends there, they have also uh, worked or discussed permaculture. Um, they work on seeds, they work on uh, seed bank, for example. They work on uh, construction by natural materials. They want to develop it uh, in a way which is, can be also even used in cities. Um, 
you can go and learn maybe from how they are organized, their interesting things, how they are organized as a cooperative and they co connect their cooperative to other political and social organizations in the, in the society. Uh, they have these links. And other issue is actually we, we want to start in this week's campaign against uh, the oppression uh, against the uh, ecology activists in Turkey and North Kurdistan. The last year, three, four friends have been detained and arrested. And they are in prison. Some have been released. So the first time the repression against the ecological movement has been so strong and uh, in the state of Turkey, it was not never slow, but um, the other movements got more repression than us. And this last year it affected also us. Uh, we want to start an international campaign for these people and the threat by the Turkish uh, government. Another issue is uh, we plan to, to bring the issue of forest fires more into the uh, international public. So we have ideas like this to bring uh, how the Turkish state is uh, on purpose destroying forests and livelihoods. Yes, um, these are the first points that comes in my mind. Uh, um, this is possible. And sometimes we have campaigns against certain big projects like frack, uh, dams or so. And there is all, also always something to do. I can send the, uh, the chat room my, uh, the email and you can get in contact if interested. Yeah, I mean, all of this and supporting ecological projects in Rojava as well. Um, I know that the cooperation in Mesopotamia have done some amazing crowdfunders working directly with people on the ground in Rojava through more of the working with the movement as opposed to this like super NGO model um, in order to fundraise for water and so on. Kurdish Red Crescent, Heba Sor, end up doing a lot of the kind of practical support work as well, like including things that have to do with renewable energy and things like that. Um, you know, support the defense of, of Kurdistan. Like, as we said, like these projects aren't going to exist if the region's under occupation or experiencing really brutal state repression. So we can't just, you know, look for the ecological projects to support. We also need to support the defense of the region, you know, using all the means at our disposal. So I guess like with more broad brushstrokes of like, you know, what can we do? How can we support like one fight Turkish state fascism in any way you can? Um, to supporting the freedom, fighting for the freedom of Abdullah Ocalan uh, is really important. He's been a political prisoner for 21 years now. He's the intellectual, theoretical, you know, author of a lot of the kind of, you know, theory of democratic confederalism and the new paradigm and is actually a political figure who would be able to work for a peaceful solution in Kurdistan, but he's been kept in more or less solitary confinement for like over two decades now. So actually fighting for the freedom of Ocalan from a Turkish prison is really important as part of this defense of the ecological projects of the region. And finally, like build up your social movements at home work as much as you can to strengthen your social movements to weaken the grip that capitalism and state fascism has on your community and your country and your land because Rojava and you know Kurdistan can't exist in isolation it's something that needs to we need to stand alongside Rojava in a revolutionary sense not just kind of like extend a helping hand when it becomes necessary when the region's on the brink of invasion so don't be afraid to completely transform your life in order to um, fight for a world based on freedom and justice and dignity um, so that's that's all really yeah and that's a perfect place to stop uh, I want to thank you and Erjan for taking time out to talk to us all today. It's been a really fascinating uh, event. I hope everyone clicked on all the various links so that we can support the Komen Academy, make Rojava green again, Mesopotamia Ecology Movement, Institute for Social Ecology. 
Um, just thank you all for taking time out of your day to uh, participate in the event. Stay engaged. You know, this is part of an ongoing series by our Rojava working group. So there will be more events in the future. Uh, we are, I just saw a question, we, we did record this and we're posting it on our YouTube channel. So keep your eyes peeled there. Um, we have a couple classes starting next week. Like I said, uh, feel free to check those out. And yeah, again, thanks to everyone. It was a really fascinating, fantastic event. Until next time. Thank you.